thank you so much, Christy, for joining me today. Super excited to talk about everything you and Rebellious Foods are up to. Um, it's it's really been a, a delight to talk to a lot of people in, I guess, the future of food sector, I would call it. And there's so much going on in the transformation in, in our food systems. So it's, it's a really exciting topic to, to chat about. Let's talk a little bit about your journey, because I saw you were a, a mechanical engineer in the aerospace industry. So how the heck did you end up in food? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It, it's definitely been a bit of a journey. As many people do, I, I feel like I'm passionate about a lot of different social issues, but I also really loved being a mechanical engineer in the aerospace industry. So you're exactly right. I got my multiple degrees in mechanical engineering, and I went to work for a couple different aerospace industry, uh, aerospace companies, including ATK Space Systems, uh, some consulting companies doing some ground-based telescopes and other types of work, and then Boeing commercial airplanes. So, and then Boeing commercial airplanes. And that was my, you know, I, I just really loved working in the aerospace industry. I still do. Um, I still love supporting, uh, you know, the engineering feats that, that it takes to essentially share the, the, the skies and the outer space. And it's just something that I'm really passionate about. However, like many people, there are so many social justice issues here on earth that require our attention. And also like many people, I was attempting to try to fit that work or that volunteer work into the in-between time of my career in, in another industry, which, you know, worked well for a very long time. I was in the aerospace industry for 15 years. And um, on the side, I would volunteer for um, social justice causes like women's rights, women's reproductive rights. I would volunteer for um, animal rights causes, animal welfare issues, for meat reduction, got volunteer opportunities, things like that, veg fests and things like that. It's as a way of trying to, you know, live my values, but not not just live them for myself, but also to help make the change in the world that we wish to see. You know, there's an active component to activism that is an important part of um, making a difference in the world. So I eventually, you know, really honed in on one area of activism that meant a lot to me. I, I care a lot about activism in, by changing laws to protect animals and to protect people. Um, I worked as a volunteer or volunteered as a volunteer at the, with the Humane Society of the United States doing that kind of work and later helped to start a political action committee called the Humane Voters of Washington here in Washington State, um, where we, we were and still do uh, advocate for um, candidates as well as laws that you know, essentially protect animals and how, you know, address how we treat them. So all of those things really came to fruition when I really decided to focus on farm animal protection. And when that particular issue obviously resonated with a lot of other issues like human health, climate change, that really motivated me to really look into opportunities to either volunteer more or advocate more, or eventually to st start rebellious foods as a way of addressing high large-scale industrial animal agriculture. Did you have a certain network or or was there a catalyst to even get into the food space? You know, it's it's one thing to obviously do policy, kind of change things around factory farming. It's another thing to actually like go found a company in the sector and try to create and use technology you know, for food. So do you have, did you have any idea, like, was there people around you that were sort of in the space that said, hey, you can take your skills as a, you working on planes as a mechanical engineer and use that to sort of disrupt the, the food system? The answer to that is kind of. I had always wanted to be an entrepreneur um, since I was a teenager. And I remember one of the first classes I took in college was Entrepreneurship 101. <laughs> I had to write a business plan of which I don't even remember what it was all about, but I just really found that interesting. I had the desire to essentially run my own operation or find a way to do things differently. That being said, it wasn't something I pursued for, you know, 20 something more years after that. And so I think there was a certain amount of will and desire within me already to, to be an entrepreneur and take the risks that you have to take and leap over the barriers that you have to leap, leap over, not just once at the beginning, but pretty Pretty much every day until now. <laughs> and so there was definitely that desire. And then I was volunteering.
volunteering a lot of my time with the Humane Society of the United States, which is our national animal welfare organization. So most local shelters are run by some sort of local humane society, but the Humane Society of the United States is our national um, animal welfare organization working on a wide variety of issues from, you know, animal testing legislation and advocacy to farm animal protection to animals and circuses, you know, wide variety of issues that essentially fight for all animals. And that's really, that really appealed to me. But one area I happened to be volunteering in was the Meatless Monday advocacy program. And at Boeing, I you know, introduced or helped to introduce uh, Meatless Mondays to a couple of the cafeterias there. It was, it was a, it was mildly successful. I can, <laughs> can imagine the yeah. population of Boeing commercial airplanes wasn't so interested in the <laughs> eating tofu, but um, but the, it didn't have to just be tofu, but sometimes sure. that's just the range of what people think of when they think of meatless. But then I ran into a lot of great people there. I ran into Christy Middleton, um, who was at HSUS, and Josh Balk, who was also at HSUS and still is. And they, you know, suggested, you know, at some point, somebody really needs to start a plant-based meat company, or specifically a plant-based chicken company that can actually beat the price of chicken. Because plant-based meat is notorious for being way too expensive. Expensive. It's a very popular market right now, but it is way too expensive. And in 10 years and $3 billion and impossible and beyond, we have yet to even really, really hit the price of animal-based meat products, particularly chicken. Like sometimes we get close to the price of beef products, um, but chicken, we're not even scratching the surface quite yet. So yeah, I went to volunteer for another organization called the Good Food Institute. I briefly worked for them for a year or so after that, and decided at that point that I could see one very particular issue that I felt like I could tackle, which was trying to address large-scale meat consumption, specifically large-scale chicken consumption. And this is a very, very different topic than um, than just starting a plant-based meat company. It is more about understanding the manufacturing behind making these products right. rather right. than yeah. necessarily focusing exclusively on one product or another. Let's get into a little bit of rebellious food because it, it seemed its main sort of focus right now is sort of solving that chicken issue, right? And, and having a, a plant-based chicken. So I guess walk us through, I guess, the mission and vision of rebellious now, and then maybe we'll get into to what the future might look like. Yeah. So I started the company as Seattle Food Tech, and sometimes you'll even see that on our uh, website or other places. But Seattle Food Tech is our corporate name and our brand name doing business as is Rebellious Foods. So we're very proud of our brand. Um, it really speaks to what we're trying to do at Rebellious, which is change how we go forward in the meat industry. And it gives people the under, you know, the feeling like we're being rebellious and doing something better, being some doing something different, breaking the status quo and having a little fun with it because the word belly is in the middle there. So that that's just a, our fun way of both being fun and um, serious as we're trying to make change in the world. So yes, yeah, Seattle Food Tech and Rebellious Foods has the fundamental mission of addressing the high cost, low volume and quality at scale problems that the plant-based meat industry has been plagued with really since its beginning. Um, although the beginning of the plant-based meat industry starts in 1899 when we first commercially started making plant-based meat in the United States. And there's a long, long history to look at when you're trying to understand the plant-based meat space. But mo more modern, in more modern days, the plant-based meat space continues to be really plagued by this issue around why we can't make more, better, and higher quality plant-based meat at scale. And that was the issue that we wanted to address. And given my background in manufacturing technology in the aerospace industry at Boeing Commercial Airplanes and elsewhere, um, that was a, a ta that was an area that I felt like I could tackle. So what we do at Rebellious is we design, we design, build, and deploy. And deploy is a key word there, production technology that makes it possible to make plant-based meat at 60% lower cost than it would be otherwise. It also dramatically increases the quality of products, especially what's called quality at scale, and then, um, and then addresses the volume issues. So in the United States alone, we only produce about one half of 1% of the volume of animal-based meat in plant-based meat. And as a result, you know, there's literally only one meal of plant-based meat 
per person per year in the United States if you amortize it across everyone or average it across everyone. I see. I see. So when we talk about plant-based, you know, meat, chicken, or, or food in general, so like what actually goes in to, let's say like plant-based chicken or, or plant-based meat? Is it, a health, is it a healthier option than sort of normal meat? So just at a base level, let, let's kind of start there. Yeah, plant-based meat is definitely a healthier option than animal-based meat counterparts, such as, you know, chicken, beef, and pork. Um, for a lot of really, really basic reasons, the first basic reasons is cholesterol and saturated fat from a micronutrient perspective. Plant-based meat has no cholesterol, often has significantly less saturated fat, depending on the product that you're considering, and certainly is the case for rebellious. Um, sometimes less sodium. And, you know, there's a lot of new information recently on the effect, impacts of even just animal proteins versus plant proteins. So you're, you're obviously choosing that plant protein instead of, of getting some of those amino acids from animal-based proteins. And then on top of that, you know, plant-based meat tends to have a little bit more fiber in it where animal meat doesn't have fiber. It's just not something that's native to animal-based meat. And so there's a lot of real benefits there. Um, and then there's cursory benefits to other types of problems in the meat industry. For example, in the chicken industry, um, chicken is heavily heavily dependent on antibiotics and avoiding those both in the environment and for for those who have found it, you know, a problem in the food, you know, food we eat. Um, a lot of schools and parents really try to avoid antibiotic uh, laden chicken. And one way to do that is to eat plant-based chicken because anim, um, antibiotic free chicken is still a minority of the products in, in the chicken industry. Sometimes I think it's just less than 5%. Maybe it's growing a little bit from there. The same thing is true for fish, you know, so much fish that you would eat right out of the ocean, even if it was wild caught is heavily laden with microplastics and mercury contamination, things like that. All things that you would really, really should not be eating. So plant-based versions of that, or even as we talked about is cultured versions of that are really a valuable, um, a valuable substitute um, for your health. So lots of really important reasons to eat plant-based or, or alternatives to meat consumption. And, and then of course, you know, when it comes to beef, one of the biggest arguments is climate change. You yeah. know, the, the impact um, of eating beef is outsized. Um, it, it's actually also true for chicken. Um, it's just not as outsized as it is for beef. I'm really fascinated about the, the cultured side of all this and I kind of wanted to get your your thoughts on that side of things do you plan to sort of play in that sector do you see you know that as a, a, a as a rival in the space at all like what how do you look at the idea that you can create real meat or real sort of chicken from you know cells right cellular agriculture like it's it's kind of phenomenal so I see like in the future plant-based cell-based foods is going to actually be the normal thing where traditional sort of animal based protein would almost be like a luxury, right? It's, it's, yeah. very, it's sort of consumed very lightly rather than as a commodity. Well, that, that would be what one would hope um, is that <laughs> we can, we can severely bring down the, uh, the hundred, 108 billion pounds of animal meat that we can produce and yeah. consume in the United States alone, not including fish by the way. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that it's a fantastic development that cultured meat is now, shall we say on the table, <laughs> not on everybody's Boom. table, but it's on the table, but you know, I don't see it as competition. And, and there's a lot of really important reasons why it is. It is literally another tool in the toolbox to address a, what can seem, right. sometimes seem like an intractable problem. And the other reason that I don't really see it as a competition per se is because plant-based meat and even a lower cost plant-based meat can address a lot of issues right now right now, right, right. <laughs> right now, rebellious chat based chicken nuggets are in over 30 school districts on the, you know, Pacific Northwest and West Coast soon to be in the, you know, Midwest and other areas of the United States. Plant based meat is in every state in the United States and available pretty much worldwide, even on a very small scale that it is. It's still a drop in the bucket compared to the size and scope of the global meat industry, but it is here today and able to meet a lot of people's most people's needs for their products today. Is it going to necessarily replace a raw, you know, medium rare steak for that person who really just 
is dead set on killing an animal <laughs> to eat their meat? Absolutely not. You know, it's probably not going to do that. But how much of beef do we eat in that form? Well, less than 50%, I'll tell you that. In the chicken industry, 52% of all chicken is processed chicken products. The majority of the meat industry in the United States actually can be addressed pretty easily with plant-based products. You spoke a little bit earlier about policy and your, your sort of work in that in that realm for, for a little bit. When you look at, when you talk to policymakers and you just sort of see the laws in the books, is there a way, it seems like policy can really accelerate a lot of this transition to a much more healthier, you know, food supply chain and supply system. Because it seems like throughout my life, at least like we've subsidized very unhealthy foods mm -hmm. and very unhealthy farming practices. Why not subsidize the opposite of that? That will create, you know, more jobs. It'll create a healthier population. And it'll also, you know, really, really scale up, you know, climate change, change efforts. Like, do you, do policymakers realize this and are there efforts at all to, to make that, that happen? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the opportunity to change policy, both for, you know, things as simple as city councils declaring meatless Mondays as a way, or, you know, there's like green Tuesdays or green Wednesdays or something like that. Green Mondays um, as a way of encouraging their populations to eat less meat is definitely a policy, so, so to speak, decision or an advocacy kind of decision. Um, but a lot of legislatures have taken it even farther here in Washington state. In this legislative session, we actually uh, were and are still considering, I believe, the you know plant-based meat in institutions and and government run um, run institutions as a way of basically saying, you know what, we know the issues here. Why aren't we kind of pushing that forward? And so that legislation, I think, is still working its way through the system. You know, even at the federal level, there's so much more we can do because you know for the national school lunch program with which dictates yes. the products in 100,000 school districts across the United States for feeding low-income um, students. But that is largely based on commodity meat and other commodity products, but also commodity chicken. And it's very hard to compete, but that's a, one of the products that we make at Rebellious Foods is to compete with commodity chicken so that we can get our products also reimbursed for those schools through the National School Lunch Program. So there's a, a real policy opportunity there. Now, the product had to exist, and that's what we did at Rebellious values foods so that people could actually choose it and then get reimbursed for it and get it, you know, get it through the system so that money can start flowing to schools when they choose those alternative products. But the more we can encourage schools to, you know, you can make the climate change, better climate change decision or, or the better antibiotic free ver um, version of chicken, all of those are are really good ways of changing policy that ultimately impacts people's choices. Yeah, the, there seems to be some low hanging fruit when you talk yeah. about, you know, from a federal level or a state level, and then obviously schools, I mean, it's such a, I was speaking with somebody the other day, and he was talking about pitching, you know, a school district uh, around mm -hmm. sort of, you know, clean, clean food that they sort of produce just condiments, right, just mm -hmm. ketchup and mustard, like having not even the, you know, whole thing or whatever, right. Um, and, and some other stuff, but he said, you know, it, it was just about cost. And it, it wasn't about health at all. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it yeah. just really struck me how like, you know, we, we say, we, you know, we got to protect the kids. And even with COVID, right, like the kids were mainly not, thank God, right, they're not, they weren't as affected as other, you know, age populations, yet that we were still trying to take it, like, we're still trying to take care of them, we're still trying to tell them wear masks, all this stuff, yet they're putting horrible food in their body every day, right? <laughs> it, and it's sort of this, like, I, I don't understand why we can't even get some of this low hanging fruit of where, Hey, we could, we could serve our kids healthy food at a, at a point in their lives where their body is maturing and, and need healthy sort of proteins and minerals and fiber, whatever it may be. This seems to be very low hanging fruit. And if it, it seems like it just comes down to money, is that it? It comes down or to education money. even yeah. education maybe comes down to money. I don't think it comes down to education actually, <laughs> because I mean, it's not like the people who are, who are choosing the school lunches are necessarily are necessarily not well-informed about nutrition. Right. Most schools have a nutritionist on staff. Mm. They, they know what they're doing and, and they're very intelligent about it. It does come down to cost. We don't, we underfund our schools, just like we underfund paying our teachers. And if we did a better job of that, um, both at the, you know, 
state and federal level, it would be there would be better options for for schools. Um, I think also, you know, the there are certain school requirements, like the requirements to offer dairy milk as part of the the school lunch program, is an unnecessary restriction, especially because most people don't naturally want to continue drinking milk beyond breastfeeding when they're a baby um, because we are not baby cows and I don't drink baby cow milk. And so it is a very odd thing to continue to force upon children um, past, you know, one or two years old or however long kids breastfeed. But it's just like, it's just, it's a very odd kind of policy decision. Um, but it does, it does really come down to offering um, products that the school can fundamentally afford. I think one of the things that is hard to understand is just how hard it is to make change in some of these situations. When you're trying to feed a school district of 100,000 kids and the average, you know, the average household income is between 15 and $30,000 a year. If that, (laughs) that's a terrifying prospect that, you know, just getting these kids food at all sometimes is is the bigger challenge on people's plates. So, you know, childhood poverty goes from, you know, those types of issues. You're in the position of a school administrator. You're not just tackling childhood nutrition or getting better food into schools. You're literally tackling childhood poverty. Right. And, um, and that's, that's one of the other reasons that, you know, it's really helpful for businesses like Rebellious to do whatever they can to offer an alternative that actually fits within the school lunch, essentially the school lunch program, mm-hmm. so that those schools can make a really, really simple choice. It's they're not having to basically convince kids to eat broccoli instead of chicken nuggets. It's hard enough to get kids to eat right. anything that you want them to <laughs> eat. But if you can give a, a instant alternative, which is what, you know, the, the private sector is attempting to do just like rebellious, that's a much easier way of making change um, Mm -hmm. for those people who have to make those hard decisions. And bringing down that cost is also obviously part of our mission. But, you know, I agree. It seems like low hanging fruit. It's just not the easiest thing in the world to do when you've got so many, so many mouths to feed. When you talk about scale and sort of getting this to a place where it can compete at a pricing level, um, with a lot of these different systems that are already in place. Where where are we at in that? You know, where, where do we say we're sort of at in, in getting there? Yeah, so most plant-based meat costs between, and specifically plant-based chicken, because that's obviously the sector that requires the most help right now. Plant-based chicken is is about two to three times the cost of animal-based chicken. And even plant-based beef is still running sometimes two times, sometimes a little less than one time cost. So maybe 50% above the price of beef. Part of that happens because the price of beef has gone up quite a bit. Um, Even the price of chicken has gone up, um, but so is the price of ingredients for plant-based meat. So sometimes there's a moment when you kind of meet in the middle at two times, sometimes it's three times. So that's kind of how the market works sometimes. But yeah, we're we're a long way away. And it, it may seem relatively simple to say, okay, well, we need to be selling plant-based meat at close to $2 a pound, but right now we're at $4 a pound in the, and that would be twice as much the cost and sometimes it's higher. That may seem like not a big difference on a per pound basis, but when you're talking about 700,000 pounds, it makes a really, yeah. really, really big difference. Yeah. And that's where you get into the issues of like addressing that difference. And if you can bring it down by 30%, hey, you're going to find some market where, yeah, that will be tolerated. But fundamentally, we need to get it down to that, you know, about two dollars ish a pound for the consumer purchase price, or even the food service purchase price. The way we do that, and um, a way most plant-based meats are saying they will do it, is to just increase scale. And there's no doubt that commodities of scale make a difference in price. Um, That is basic economics. It's basic manufacturing. But the problem with plant-based meat is that we make it wrong. We make it with tools that are used primarily, in fact, entirely for producing animal-based meat products. They're um, deconstructive tools like bowl choppers, tumblers, and conveyors that are all used to try to chop down meat into small pieces and then put it into um, different forms and 
things like that. That's all fine and dandy, except it doesn't scale very well for making plant-based meat. And when you look at the first principles of manufacturing plant-based meat, you start to realize, well, these are just the wrong tools. And that was fundamentally why I started Rebellious Foods is because I, I saw this problem and we spent the last three and a half years solving this particular problem where fundamentally we said, if we had to go back to first principles and develop the equipment that was the right equipment for making plant based meat, what Uh, would it be? And that's what we did at Rebellious Foods. We developed a system called the Mach 1 production system, M-O-C-K. From your aerospace days, I guess. Yes, from my aerospace days, exactly. It makes mock meat, but it also moves really, really fast. And the uh, the Mach 1 production system can actually increase margins or lower costs by about 20%. Um, Actually, it looks like it'll lower the manufacturing cost by 60%. And what happens is we can start to actually approach the price of chicken or or even beat the price of chicken if, if chicken continues to go up as a result of the correct manufacturing um, tools and methodology. So I like to end a little bit on on the future and, and a little bit about what success looks like or means to you. So I, I know it's tough to do this, but if we could look out, let's say, you know, five to 10 years and look, the space is growing rapidly, right? There's technology changing every day. There's, there's all these different policy changes that could happen maybe in, in that amount of time. So things could could scale up quickly or, or could stall kind of depending on a lot of those different variables. When you look at the next decade, what does success look like for you? And maybe what are some of the goals that, that you want to see, see happen? Yeah, so success obviously has to be measured in many different forms, yeah. but success for Rebellious Foods is the success of our customers finding products that are high quality, always what they're expecting, meaning we've always met their expectations for quality and taste, always available to them wherever they are looking for products, and then fundamentally hitting that price point so they're never having to choose plant-based over feeding the whole family. And that that is our uh, fundamental goal is to make sure that we hit the the price, um, the quality, and the volume available for for every consumer, and you know start to really move the needle on how much plant based meat is available. And it's it's a different strategy. I think there's a lot of plant based meat companies that have been up and coming over the last few years, rebellious included, but they have really focused on product as the only differentiator between themselves and others, which is fine. We need a lot more plant based meat products. What's different about rebellious is we really had bypassed and were bypassing the immediate market opportunity to go after the bigger problem to address the spend the last three years developing the tools necessary, then we can, as we are now really getting into the market, as we're we're getting into our first, you know, million dollar quarter, <laughs> we are going to, um, we're going to be offering those products at much better prices. We see much better quality consistently across the, the volumes that we can make. And also the Mach 1 production system will be able to triple the volume on a production floor. So we're in the process of deploying that, that great piece of technology right now, but it Fundamentally, what consumers will see and what we're excited to offer is, you know, to take my aerospace days forward, a faster, better, cheaper plant-based meat. <laughs> uh, before we sign off here, where can people find Rebellious Foods? Like, what's the distribution and footprint like right now? Yeah, so you can find uh, Rebellious up and down the West Coast in the Midwest at Jewel Osco and on the East in the Mid-Atlantic states um, in Albertson, Safeway and Acme. Um, the best way to find our products is to go to Rebellious, R-E-B-E-L-L-Y-O-U-S dot com and look for our store finder right at the top of the page and you can find wherever it is near you. Don't have a whole lot in the uh, Southern United States at the moment, but you know, please remember we're only three and a half years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh no, that's super young, super young. You'll get there for sure. Well, thank you so much, Chrissy. It was great to chat with you. Um, best of luck to you and the team for the next decades to come and, uh, you know, Godspeed on this uh, great endeavor that you're on. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. Yeah.